Hi, good afternoon. I hope you can hear us. I'm looking over to them. Yep, they're saying you can hear us. Excellent. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Greg Lois. I'm the managing partner of Lois Law Firm, which defends employers in workers' compensation matters in New York and New Jersey. And I'm joined today by Tashia. Hi, everyone. I am Tashia Rasul. I'm a here. I'm I'm a partner here at Lois Law Firm, and Today we are going to discuss a very interesting topic that's come up in New York and New Jersey workers' compensation claims recently. Hot topic. Marijuana. Yep. Yes. We're going to talk about this topic in two big uh, pieces, uh, state by state. So I'm going to cover New Jersey uh, workers' compensation claims and interplay with the medical marijuana laws. And to shield discuss New York. And the way we're going to approach this is first we're going to talk about uh, can the court uh, prove or order or authorize uh, this type of medical treatment uh, or reimbursement to a medical provider? And then how do they, how do we pay for it? How yes. do we, the carrier, the employer, the self-insured, the third-party administrator, the benefits administrator, how do we actually pay for this uh, treatment? So uh, ladies first, put All you right. on the hot speed first. Okay. Uh, so let's talk so, about it in New York. New York, okay. So New York's been addressing this issue for about a year now, just over a year. Um, the appellate division has not addressed it. We don't have anything from any of the circuit courts. It's really just the board panel decisions. And the issue has been presented to the board in terms of is uh, medicinal marijuana, is it like necessary, or is it allowed in workers' compensation claims? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> um, and if it is, how are the carriers or how are employers liable for payment of same? So what we've been seeing is um, in New York, it's becoming more prevalent, the use of medicinal uh, marijuana. And over the course of the past year, there's been several cases where providers are recommending the use of marijuana for claimants for their injuries, and it's mainly for pain. Now, as a background, in New York public health law, uh, section 3360, subsection 7, lists all of the <laughs> conditions. Did you just do that by memory? Yes. Wow, amazing. <laughs> I learned from the best. Okay. Um, so it lists all of the conditions that are um, that qualify for use of marijuana. And they're mainly those that are life-threatening. So, you know, the cancers, the multiple sclerosis, the severe nerve damage, and so forth. But in 2017, they added chronic pain. So mm. guess what? In New York, the state where opioid use is so prevalent and it's becoming a problem, the providers are starting to run with the chronic pain addition, and they're starting to prescribe mm. or attempt to prescribe marijuana for chronic pain. Now, the board panel has addressed this issue in a number of cases. And they've essentially set forth a test that the provider and the claimant must pass in order for the, um, the treatment to be authorized by the board. So the answer to the question whether it's authorized by the board, it's yes, if the test, um, if, if each prong of the test is met. So first of all, the provider must be accredited by the state department of health. They must be, um, certified to uh, prescribe marijuana to patients, okay. and they must be coded or authorized by the workers' compensation board. Separately, separately coded. Yes, yeah, separately coded, oh. yes. Um, then after that requirement is met, they must show that the marijuana is medically necessary and that it's for a serious condition and a causally related serious condition. Well, I mean, how do they show that? Because I know it's not covered by the medical treatment guidelines. All right. So that's one of the issues. That's actually the issue that's been addressed in every single board panel decision on the marijuana use issue. Um, so it's not covered by the medical treatment guidelines. It's silent about marijuana, mm -hmm. right? So what happens when they want to do treatment that's outside of the guidelines? They must submit a variance request. And in submitting the variance request, they must prove that it's medically necessary. And the burden is on the claimant and his doctor to prove that it's medically necessary. Okay. So they must outline all of the factors, all the treatment that he's undergone, why the treatment within the medical guidelines, medical treatment guidelines were not sufficient, why they did not improve the claimant's condition, and how the marijuana is going to improve the claimant's condition. And when, once that is submitted, the carrier or the employer has the opportunity to respond to it like they would any normal uh, 
variance request. Variance request, sure. exactly. So they have the opportunity to get a peer review or an IME doctor, review it, review the request. They must file the denial timely in order for it to be upheld. Um, so in the cases where the doctor has just prescribed the medical marijuana and the claimant says, hey, well, I had to go to the clinic to get my vaporizer because the doctor prescribed it. I need to get reimbursed for it. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? So the board has addressed that issue. And the board said that if the treatment hasn't been authorized in the first place, he can't get reimbursed, which makes sense. It's the same with any other treatment under workers' compensation, right? Sure. Um, so to, to sum it all up, it is it can be authorized in New York. It just has to be medically necessary, and all of the requirements have to be met. Now, the next issue is, well, it's authorized. How do you pay for it? Do you pay for it? So we know that marijuana is still illegal under federal law, mm -hmm. and the argument by the employers and carriers is that they shouldn't be directed to pay for it because it's essentially aiding and abetting in committing a federal crime, which makes sense. Sure. Now, the counter argument to that is, well, there's this policy, the federal policy of non-interference, even though the state laws um, legalize medicinal marijuana, uh, the federal government is not going to interfere with their policy and the state laws regarding the same. That being said, the board still has not said, hey, we're not going to, we're, we're just not going to direct payment of it. The claimant's going to get his payment somehow or the other. Right. So it has to be done indirectly. Okay. The payment has to be made to the claimant. So for example, through a medical and um, transportation reimbursement request, or even given to the claimant's attorney and have him reimburse the claimant for it. The carrying employer is not going to actually issue a check to the claimant or the, to the provider for the medicinal marijuana. So that's really the status of the, the use of uh, marijuana in New York. Um, we are seeing this more and more, like I said, especially with the opioid use. Doctors are getting creative now. <laughs> well, I love it. They've got everybody addicted to opioids, and now this is how they're going to get them off of opioids. Right. Um, okay. I'm going to keep going because I see that you got knocked off, but I see the audience view is still 100%. So. Yeah, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> All right, so our, our monitor and our control group is telling us that they can't see us, but I hope you can still see us. Um, in fact, I'm still seeing questions popping up, so we know that the viewers are still out there. Um, All right, so New York, it's not on the fee schedule, right? No, it's not. And no. it's not in the medical treatment guideline. No. So exactly how much to reimburse the claimant? Oh, so it'll, well, it's what they <laughs> that's paid, the really. big question, exactly. It's what they paid. I mean, the argument could be like a UCR argument, the usual mm -hmm. customary rate, but how, you know, how often does that, like, is that really successful? Um, the cases that I've seen so far, they're not billing exorbitant amounts for it. You know, I haven't seen anything in the thousands. It's usually like in the hundreds so far, which could change. Sure. Well, I can tell you in New Jersey, so I'm, I'm prepared to talk about New Jersey. I'm not as prepared as you because I have my cue card with me to give me my information. Um, so in New Jersey, the going price is between 450 and $500 an ounce from our dispensaries, which my understanding is that makes us the most expensive um, medicinal marijuana dispensaries in the country, mm -hmm. plus your 7% New Jersey state sales tax on top of that, because the state gets their cut as well. All right, uh, I see some notes here. Thank you for those of you that are writing in and saying, we can see, can see and hear both of you. That's great, because in our control room setup, we can't, we can't. <laughs> half the system died here, but we're still getting people saying that they can see us, so that's good, let's just keep going. All right, so, New York, yes, it is allowed. Yes, it can be authorized case by case basis. There's nothing in the guidelines and you're going to reimburse the claimant directly. So kind of stole the thunder out of my New Jersey uh, presentation that I have here. Um, New Jersey has only two decisions. Um, they're both trial judge decisions, so they have absolutely no precedential or binding effect. The first decision is from December of 2016. It was decided by Judge French. Um, there is uh, the case is named Andrew Watson versus 84 Lumber. And in this case, we have a very old dog claim, 2008 claim, in which the claimant recovered a third, uh, 200 weeks of compensation for injuries to his uh, left hand and for uh, complex regional 
uh, pain syndrome, which we all know. <laughs> uh, to me, it's like one of those questionable diagnoses. Sometimes it's not a real thing. So he, his overall award was uh, entered in 2008. Uh, it says he has problems with pain in his hand. Uh, he is a part of the case which was settled. Uh, he had the right to ongoing medical care. The ongoing medical care was with an authorized pain management provider named Dr. Corda, who was picked by the insurance carrier. Uh, he sees Dr. Corda, who eventually says, you're not getting any better with me. Why don't you go see my partner? My partner has the New Jersey Medical Marijuana Certificate, so he can prescribe this medication to you. His par partner, Dr. Pulser, prescribes these medications to the uh, claimant, who then uh, comes into a workers' compensation court, files a motion for medical and temporary disability benefits, um, claiming uh, that the uh, uh, respondent, the insurance carrier, should pay for this this care. Mm -hmm. I think the carrier in this uh, case did some interesting moves, things I would have done. First, they said, well, the motion is defective. It's not emergent. Second, I want the opportunity to cross-examine your doctors, and I want to go out and get my own IME to combat this motion for men intent. They went out, got their own IME. Uh, their doctor is named Dr. Antibi. Write that name down, because in New Jersey, I don't think you ever want to use an IME doctor Dr. Antibi, because Dr. Antibi then refused to come to court and testify in defense of his opinion that the medicinal marijuana was unwarranted, unnecessary, uh, and medically unreasonable. All right, so not a great IME doctor for the uh, carrier in that case. So they essentially go in the case and have to try the case with no proofs, no defenses. Now, interestingly, uh, the treating physician, Dr. Corda, and the uh, physician that Dr. Corda sent the petitioner to, this Dr. Pulcher, also refused to come to court to testify. Huh, okay. That's interesting. Now, if I'm the law judge, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say, well, no one's coming to testify in defense of this treatment method, so I'm not ordering it. See you later. Come back. Right. Have a wonderful day, right? Uh, the judge says, no, I'm going to throw out the opinion of the IME doctor who says it doesn't need it. I'm going to accept the opinions of the, of the treating physician and Dr. Pulcher and essentially orders the carrier to reimburse the claimant. Again, doesn't mm -hmm. uh, order them to pay for the treatment, just orders them to reimburse, reimburse the claimant directly. All right, and that brings us to the second decision in New Jersey, which was just decided on uh, June 28th in Freehold, uh, Judge Lionel Simon, uh, in the case against the Township of Freehold. So we've got a municipality. What does that mean to you? Probably not the most aggressive defense attorneys on the other side, right? Uh, the claimant comes in, in this case, and says, I want my medicinal marijuana. Uh, the decision, I wasn't able to find a copy of it online. I did call the court to get a copy of it. I didn't receive it yet. Um, so I don't know the exact contours of this case, but this is another case in which the judge found that medicinal marijuana was medically necessary and reasonable and then ordered the carrier to reimburse the uh, petitioner directly. Again, the carrier is not going out to the dispensary and paying for this. Uh, they're not using banks or writing checks. They're writing a check directly to the claimant. And I think that's how it's going to work in New Jersey. Yes, on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, remember in New Jersey, we don't have treatment guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't even have AMA guidelines. We don't have IME guidelines. We don't have a fee schedule. We have judges sort of doing everything Whatever on a case-by-case case basis, and in this circumstance, the judge found that it was uh, reasonable and necessary, and then the carrier was found to have to reimburse the claimant directly. So we think that's how the reimbursement would go. doesn't violate any federal laws that we could tell, uh, so it, that's how we think it happens. All right. And I think there's going to be many more cases on this issue. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, so in New Jersey... I didn't look up the law in New York, but in New Jersey, I mean, you, you mentioned the conditions that it was marijuana could be prescribed for. Yes. So in New mm -hmm. Jersey, originally it was HIV, ALS, multiple sclerosis, cancer, Crohn's disease, and any terminal illness that's going to kill you within 12 months. That's mm -hmm. why, when you could get medicinal marijuana. Right. Now they've just expanded it to uh, anxiety, any pain, musculoskeletal pain, migraines, and Tourette syndrome. Hmm. So I think a lot of people are going to have migraines yes. now and anxiety and go get their medicinal marijuana. Right. And a lot of our workers' compensation claims, of course, the psych is a throw-in on our mm -hmm. workers' comp cases. Yeah. Also should remark, just for our New Jersey practitioners out there, that ultimately Dr. Toby, who should be is very well known in New Jersey, this is a uh, petitioner's hack, uh, completely bought and sold petitioner's uh, psychiatric physician, uh, now has the... Uh, uh, the certification by the state of New Jersey to write 
medicinal marijuana uh, prescription. So mm -hmm. I got to imagine we're going to see more and more of them, particularly in South yeah. Jersey. And I'll just note also the board panel has been consistent with its decision regarding this issue. There is only one case where it wasn't authorized or it found that it wasn't authorized, but that was before chronic pain was added to the list of conditions mm. that marijuana can be prescribed for. So they're continually making that distinction. Yes, we once said that it's not medically necessary, but it was being prescribed for chronic pain at that time, and it was before March of 2017 when chronic pain was not on the list. So as they continue adding conditions, which I'm sure they will do, yeah. Um, you know, we'll, well, we'll definitely see more. You know, I just think about it from an economic perspective. So in mm -hmm. New Jersey, the ounce of marijuana, $450 to $500, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a 30-day supply. The doctors can write up to two ounces supply in any 30 days, which to me seems like an insane amount of marijuana. Right, yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, the potency <laughs> of marijuana is controlled to 10% THC, which apparently is the active component of mm -hmm. the, uh, the drug. So th that's the maximum they can write, which means, well, the maximum this can cost is about 1100 bucks a month. Just about, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, which might be a heck of a lot cheaper than the narcotic pain medications that we've had people on for much longer periods of time as well. So it's an interesting thought. Um, the other side of this is, I don't know how I could calculate a set aside in a case like this, right? Oh, it's yes. still federally illegal scheduled drug. It's, mm -hmm. it's completely uh, illegal to prescribe at the federal level Medicare, Medicare can never federal, pay right. for it. So I think we're leaving these off of our set-aside assessments when we're setting these up for Section 20s in New Jersey or a Section 32. 32 in New York. But just an interesting thought. All right, let's jump into questions. We have a lot of questions. I want to answer as many as I can. Um, all right, so Nicole asked the question uh, sort of two different ways, and that question is, how do we know how much to pay? Is there a fee schedule? I think we answered that one a little we bit. We did. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to thank all the people who did write in and say, we can still hear you, we can still... I can see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's good. It lets us know that we're still alive and running. All right. Um, uh, Glaceria asked this question. What was the site of where to find the accepted conditions? Is there a threshold as to how much opioid reduction or opioid medication is to be denied in lieu of opioids? So I can answer that for New Jersey. New Jersey does have a website that's uh, for the medical marijuana program, the New Jersey MMP. It does list all of the um, uh, the conditions, but again, we just read them out to you, and I, I think you had the same it's ones about pretty the same much. In New York. Uh, we're talking about uh, multiple sclerosis, HIV, mul um, ALS, Crohn's disease, any terminal illness that will kill you in 12 months or less. That has now been expanded to be anxiety, um, musculoskeletal pain, I can't say that, it's like a tongue twister, <laughs> migraines, and Tourette's. And in New York, it's also like severe nerve damage. And also chronic pain, it's specific. Yeah, I saw in New York, it said the word visceral nerve damage, or visceral Vis pain. I'm yes. like, well, I don't know mm -hmm. what that is, but okay. And the information, there's a lot of information on the State Department of Health, the New York State Department of Health. Okay, and then the next question, it's kind of a compound question. She said, is there a threshold as to how much opioid reduction, uh, or do we deny opioid medication? Well, no. Uh, I can tell you in the New Jersey example, absolutely not. They, the gentleman was still on opioids. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Watson was still continuing on opioids. He just was able to show a reduction in the opioid use. Right. Yes. So uh, this should be show a decline in that dependency. Um, all right. In New York, if an IME, this is a, a question from Maria. In New York, if an IME is requested, does the medical doctor have to meet the same requirements mm -hmm. as the prescribing doctor in order for the IME to be credible? All right, so I think the answer would be yes there. Generally, we're talking yes. about credibility, it must be the IME doctor must mirror the claimant's treating doctor in terms of um, like uh, um, uh, certification, yeah, qualifications. You know, so if yes. they're board certified in something, I want to see a board certified pain management right. physician. Um, you know, in New York, I don't know, in, New, in Jersey, you have to go for the Department of Health to get your medical prescriber license for marijuana. Plus, you've got to go to the Division of Consumer Affairs and get your New Jersey Controlled Dangerous Substance License. Yeah, so it's a double certification. So it's a double in cert in yeah. Jersey uh, to do these prescriptions. Uh, I do note that in the Jersey report, the only decision that we have the reported case for, not reported, I'm sorry, the, uh, the written decision for, uh, the petitioner went out and got Dr. Kobe, who is also certified to give these medications. I think that was done to really bolster the opinion of the treating physician or bring mm -hmm. that um, opinion in. 
Um, in New York, there is no rule that you have to have the same credentialing of your IME doctor. But let me tell you, I think the judges are not going to pay much attention. If you come in with a chiropractor uh, or some other, you know, an obstetrician to combat what their pain management specialist is saying about uh, medical marijuana. I mean, it's just common sense. Huh? Right, exactly. I mean, they do, they do that with regular, regular cases as it is. They look at the specialties of the doctors. Okay, so Nicole asked the question that we sort of touched upon. For New York claims, how do you recommend resolving claims when a set aside is needed? And, and she writes, when a, Medi a Medicare set aside allocation is required. Well, good question, right? Because again, federally, Medicare can't pay for this stuff. I don't see how they could ever be a secondary payer on something that they are federally prohibited for purchasing. Right. So that is something that has to, would have to be um, figured out. All right, Matthew asked the question, in New York, if um, MG2 is received, that's a variance request and answered. Assuming it approves medical marijuana, how would you measure consumption or use? What is the, is there a range for the use of it? So I'm not certain if you're asking, how do we know if there's been diversion? Because right? mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking. I'm imagining you've got an ounce of this stuff that somebody else paid for that's got a great, easy resale street value to exactly. it. Exactly, yes. Um, and then there are all sorts of questions and concerns about testing um, someone for marijuana use, right? We know that the metabolites from marijuana use uh, don't titrate out of your system the same for two different people. We know it's very difficult to determine if someone has marijuana intoxication mm -hmm. because a chronic long-term smoker of marijuana could have tons, I mean, you know, 50, uh, I think it was Pete, uh, nanograms per pico, picoliter of blood, they could have a lot of this stuff in there, but not be stoned at all. Meanwhile, if I had that much, I'd be bouncing off right. the walls yes. even more than I normally <laughs> am, right? So uh, we don't know uh, how that's being measured. The programs do not include from, and I know the Jersey program does not, uh, any kind of drug testing to determine if they are actually utilizing the medication as it's intended to be utilized that I could see. Right, and there, there's really no formal program in New York too since this issue is fairly new, but I, I do suspect the board's gonna come down with something in the near future as this becomes a more prevalent issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the board loves to issue guidelines and paperwork yes. for forms. Yes. So uh, the fact that there's no form on this one yet is kind of surprising. Um, Deidre asked a clarifying question. Uh, did you say that in New York, the claimant gets reimbursed directly? Yes, yeah, so the claimant can get reimbursed through, by, by submitting a request for a treatment and um, medical and treatment expenses. So if the claimant goes to the dispensary with a prescription from his doctor and he gets the marijuana, he can submit that to the carrier and the carrier will be able to pay him, reimburse him for it. Right, just like we're reimbursing people for parking expenses or travel to and from a hospital or a medical appointment, it goes on the same form. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, James asked the question, at what point in the claim can we expect this to be prescribed after traditional pain med uh, <clears throat> medication has failed? Well, that's when we think it would be prescribed yeah, sure. because it has to be, it, it like there has, Treatment first has to be within the medical treatment guidelines, right? right? And they have to prescribe treatment within that. So after conservative treatment has failed, this should be like the next step or the last resort. Right. From day one, the doctor should not be prescribing medicinal Correct. marijuana. Right, I agree strongly with that. Um, Rachel asked the question, she says, this is a New Jersey specific question. Can you request weaning from opioids if the claimant is on medical marijuana? Well, the decision that we have so far, uh, the Andrew Watson versus 84 Lumber, um, the judge really did what in New Jersey we refer to as a Benson versus Coca-Cola analysis and did a look back and said essentially, he went out, he did all this stuff on his own, yeah, it was unauthorized, but it actually improved him. He was able to reduce his dependency on narcotics and he says that he has increased functionality. Okay, so Based on those two things, the judge said, you know what, this is useful for him, it's, it's medically reasonable and necessary, and that's why I authorize the use or, or instruct, really, carrier reimbursement for it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, um, that's not exactly a weaning, it's not, the, not a one-for-one -one replacement, but the judge in this decision said, I saw the opioid use go down or dependency go down, and that's why I think this was a useful treatment for him. Yes. All right. Uh, Hannah asked a question. Hi, Hannah in Omaha. Uh, can a claimant be on medical marijuana and opioids at the same time? Are there any guidelines to protect us from paying both? 
I don't know if that's a New York or a New Jersey <laughs> question because I know you do both New York and New Jersey. So in Jersey, yes, you can be on both. Absolutely. In fact, my decision to keep winging my card around, uh, uh, that did happen. Right. And same, same thing with New York, too, since there's no guidelines for the marijuana. Yep. Okay. Carol asked a question. Does this replace opioids, muscle relaxants? In other words, if the doctor prescribes medical marijuana, is he required to discontinue the opioids? Okay, I think we've been over that one. Oh, your friend Brian asked a question. <laughs> Do you believe this will become a federal issue if an out-of-state claimant is treating with medicinal marijuana for a New Jersey or New York claim? Sure, so you've got, I think what you're suggesting here is we've got people crossing state lines, et cetera. Uh, that's gonna be an interesting one for us to see how that pans out. Again, you're, you're privately directly paying the claimant to reimburse them for doing something that is federally prohibited. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Carol asked the question, do you think that your drug screens will be required to make sure they are using it? Right now they are not, Carol. Uh, what if they take medical marijuana and still buy it on the streets? Right now they may be doing that, Carol. Mm -hmm. Will they have higher concentrated marijuana than what is considered a therapeutic dose? Well, entertainingly, I don't think anyone really knows what the, well, we know the dosage is unknown. Um, and we also know that the, um, the, the time it lingers in your system has been difficult to calculate or to be, be reliable from person to person. And when I say the dosage is unknown, in the cases that we've read, and particularly some of the recent cases, these medicinal marijuana dispensaries are offering different strains of marijuana with yes. different strengths, different potencies, um, different um, uh, balances of THC to cannabinoids, and that has a different impact on how your body both absorbs it and utilizes it. And for those reasons, there is not what I've seen a standard therapeutic dose. It's doctors prescribing you ounces of marijuana at a time and saying, go smoke this. Good luck. I'll see you in 30 days. Yes. I mean, this is not something like, you know, you smoke one joint in the morning, one in the afternoon. I mean, I don't, I haven't seen things like that. They're prescribing yeah, there's, there's really no set standard or guideline. Yeah, we also had an entertaining <laughs> moment here today calling around different people's offices like, uh, what is vaping? Is that burning? Like trying to figure out some of the, some of the, the, the lingo that's going on. All right. Um, Diana asked the question, will some sort of medical testing be performed or can it be to determine the patient is following the script? Again, that is to be determined. Mm -hmm. um, urine toxicology screens, making sure there's no diversion, et cetera. Um, okay, Anna asked the question. This is a great question. What is the New York liability if a claimant on medical marijuana gets in a car accident or is deemed <clears throat> under the influence at the time? I know both programs, the New York and the New Jersey programs, include a prohibition that you may not operate a motor vehicle and certain types of other vehicles if you are uh, taking your medication. Right. In fact, they shouldn't be transporting the medication anywhere. Both states' programs say if you're transporting, it should be just going from like one doctor to the other. Uh, you should be carrying your medical marijuana license with you at all times. And they, there are very strict in both states um, the restrictions on where you can smoke it. For example, they instruct you to, to smoke the marijuana in your own home, not out in the open, not in parks, not in school-free drug zones, et cetera. They don't want these people getting in trouble with local law enforcement. Um, so the answer is, uh, if they are in an accident, uh, they will be deemed under the influence at the time, and it's not going to be our problem. They've been instructed not to do that as part of the condition of being part of these programs. Uh, John says, uh, in New Jersey, did they change the MMP to eliminate the standard that the patient has to have a bona fide relationship with their prescribing doctor for 12 months? John, that standard is not um, uh, really meaningful because a good example is this Andrew Watson case where he has, he goes to one doctor for pain management, Dr. Corda, who does not have the opportunity, the license to prescribe medical marijuana, but he just sends him over to his uh, partner, Dr. Poulter, down the hall, I guess, uh, who prescribes it immediately. Um, mm -hmm. And then the law judge looking back at this case said, well, you did do an intake, you took your own exam. Okay, we're considering that uh, uh, your bona fide medical treater at that time. Uh, Jean uh, asked the question, how would medical marijuana affect a return to work? Example, on a bull operate machinery, is there a law regarding driving? So we address driving. Uh, the interesting thing is in the most recent case, the McNeary versus Township of Freehold, um, 
that claimant has returned to work in a limited capacity. Also, Andrew Watson versus 84 Lumber. No longer works for 84 Lumber. He's working in the service industry now, which, by the way, is one of the things that the judge of compensation took into consideration in saying, hey, this has been successful. You did return to work in some capacity, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, yes, these uh, someone on medical marijuana can return to work. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of these. we got a couple more left. We're at 30 minutes. I don't see people dropping off, so let's just keep going. Uh, Rebecca Borchers, Rebecca asked the question, to clarify, marijuana cannot be, I, don't, I'm, I think the question might be missing a sentence in there. Rebecca, if you rewrite your question, I'll try to respond. Patricia says, for companies which have no tolerance drug policy and where medical marijuana is approved by the board, will there be issues with termination of an employee is found in violation of the company drug policy? Mm. Right. So you've got the right employer to terminate someone for reasons of they violate your drug policy, comma, except for now they have a medical condition that necessitates this medication, which is legal in your state. So, yes, that termination, even though it is because they are not following a work rule, uh, may be found to be uh, involuntary and you may still have to pay them temporary disability benefits. Um, Jacqueline asked the question, in New York, how long does a carrier have to respond to a variance seeking medical marijuana? It's the same for any variance for any, <clears throat> excuse me, any treatment, um, 30 days. Okay. Uh, Glaceria says, if the claimant is released to return to work, okay, that's the same question. We did that one already. Um, okay, Matthew asked a great question. Are claimants granted an identification card approving medical marijuana? So yes, in both states they are. They get a sort of they like have a to license. Be certified. Yeah. Yes. And it costs $100. Uh, and I looked through the two New Jersey cases to see if the employer was required to pay for the license. I just think, I'm sorry, I'm just laughing. I'm just yeah. a license to smoke weed. Really? <laughs> this is what our society's come to. It's a real thing now. Uh, you could have a license, but yeah. And the, and the rules actually say that if you are transporting your Minnesota marijuana, um, you know, you've got to keep your license with you. I'm sorry, um, maybe I'm immature, but I think it's funny. Um, Jacqueline, do you think the New York Workers' Compensation Board will be addressing this in the revision of the non-acute pain guidelines? I think I think they will. They they will because this is going to continue to be an issue. Okay, a couple more questions here that I'm going to skip because they're either ones we've sort of already covered or they're asking questions about car accidents. Uh, Pat. Uh, Kay asked the question. She says, so is it to be smoked? I thought it was pill form. That's what I kind of thought too. <laughs> it seems less pharmaceutical when you're being asked to smoke something. Right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so in the control booth, uh, the lovely Lauren is saying, well, it could be an edible too. That's a thing. And we did some research today because the instructions, the New Jersey instructions are all about smoking. You're you're receiving literally a bag of marijuana with the instructions to smoke it. They even give smoking instructions. Um, so smoking or vaporizing, which is kind of like a cleaner burning, because I guess there's no paper or residue. Yes. Okay, so yeah, uh, Pat, I, I was kind of like taken aback as well with the idea of people lighting up joints in their house at our expense, but hey, it's a real world thing that we're actually dealing with. Okay, Carol asked a question. Um, is there a requirement to start with a low dose and increase it over time if needed? Uh, no. So, ha, ha, ha. No. Uh, remember, these are doctors prescribing. Uh, it's, I guess, grown under careful circumstances and monitored. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a plant, and they are just being given a bag of it. Again, the orders that we've reviewed or the cases we have talked about ounces of this, um, they don't seem to be given a schedule of, hey, smoke three joints in the morning and three no, in the afternoon. Uh, I think it's kind of an as-needed thing. Uh, and so the dosage doesn't seem to be, um, I mean, in my, my scientific. It just, here it is. Right. I mean, and, you, can, you can smoke it for two days and then nothing for the rest of the week until guess, next week again, right? You know, or are you going finish to it all off in one week or something. And uh, the, the prescriptions are limited to uh, 30 or 60 day supplies. And there are some limitations, two ounces per 30 days. Um, that's, that's Jen, Jennifer asked the same question, essentially, what's the, what's the maximum script? A, a lot of questions here that I'm skipping. So to, to, answer, to also add to um, Jennifer's okay. question, 
if they are submitting a variance request without an end date, I I think that's a good reason to deny it. So it, it oh, yeah. should be for a month or two months at the most. Right. Um, Tish asks a great question, which I don't know the answer to. Uh, just to confirm the return to work strategy, the employee must use the product in a home environment. The employee cannot consume the product at work. Um, maybe she's telling me that that's their policy, but I haven't seen anything that says that in the um, the programs that I've reviewed. No, I haven't. But it's interesting. Either. That's an interesting thought. They'll just um, smoke it at night after they get home from work. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Kyle asked a great a great question, and it's something we've sort of danced around. Do you know how this will impact claim costs or settlement costs for employers? All right, so the first thing is the uncertainty. I think we can be very certain with telling you that if a law judge rules that, quote, it is medically reasonable and medically necessary, close quote, in New Jersey, or it fits under the New York sort of test as well, which mm -hmm. is very close to that, hey, it's helping the person, that yes, you're going to be found to have uh, an, a petitioner in New Jersey or a claim in New York who's going to be authorized to have medicinal marijuana. So the first part of this question is really, um, from imagining the case perspective is, yep, these things can happen. The second part of that is like, how much is this gonna cost you? Uh, in New Jersey, it's very clear. Um, and it's really because New Jersey is being made fun of or throughout all of these uh, uh, articles that I've read saying like, why is it so expensive? It's $450 for an ounce of marijuana. Uh, you, you know, the, the medicinal marijuana is quite expensive apparently. But that gives you a sort of ballpark. I mean, that's how much it could cost. And you could get up to two ounces a month. So that's where we're coming up with that figure. Plus, of course, the high state sales tax. Mm -hmm. So that is what it's going to drive up the cost. Now, the cost of settlement. Well, I think once you start paying for narcotics, uh, marijuana, it's really hard to get the claimants to settle. They don't want that, you know, either second source of income, right, because we're talking about diversion going on, or they're addicted. I mean, they, these are yes. opiate addicted, narcotic addicted claimants or petitioners anyway. I mean, this is a very tough or difficult population to settle with, particularly if now you're giving them uh, marijuana. Marijuana, is, yes. You know, if they can get it. and watch TV all day, right? <laughs> So I think this is not going to make uh, settlements easier. Um, but the other side of it is it's not that expensive on a month-to-month -month basis. Right. I mean, it's quite up there or comparable to what you're paying in narcotics right now. So uh, that's a thought. So it's a little bit to be seen, but I can tell you that the, the first part of the impact on claim costs is always uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty of, is this something that's going to be ordered? Is this some, Now, in New Jersey, both of these decisions are trial-level decisions. It does not appear that there's any signal that there's, first of all, the old case from 2016 was absolutely not appealed. We're not gonna see any new case, change in case law from that. The new case, um, from all of the media reports that we've read, there has been no statement that either uh, PMA, the insurance carrier, or uh, any one of the involved parties are going to appeal that. And likewise, in New York, there's no indication it's being taken to the third department. Right, so yeah. then you've got board panel level decisions, and that's the first level of review of a trial judge. Again, not precedential, although they do love to cite themselves yes, over and over as again, they've been doing. Um, but not precedential. So the first part of that, how is this going to affect claim costs and risk is, well, well I think we see which way the wind is or the smoke is blowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, I see what you did see there. You did there. <laughs> uh, all right, in both states. All right. Um, I'm going to skip some of these questions that we've asked because it feels like a lot of people have um, typed in. All right, uh, do we have to reimburse for rolling papers or pipes? Interesting question, mm. Gail. Uh, nothing I've read seems to indicate that. Um, it is interesting to tell you that in the, at least in the New Jersey program, uh, paraphernalia, which is illegal, by the way, it's illegal to have a bong or a water pipe or some of these uh, equipment, um, but if you have your license, you can have that stuff. So in New York, in one of the board panel decisions, they glossed over it. I don't know about the paper, but one of the things that the claimant submitted the reimbursement for was the, the pipe. In fact, the, the, the word pipe was <laughs> the word pipe was mentioned and the board panel said, yes, you have to reimburse him for that. Uh, Rick asked a great question. There are many strains of marijuana. Is there going to be a sealant or quality of pot that is minimally prescribed versus maximum strength? Yes. Yeah, so interestingly in uh, Jersey, 
uh, the other um, sort of these magazines that are involved in marijuana is, I guess, High Times magazines, mm -hmm. all these other ones that have jumped in there, cannabis magazines, um, have both said that New Jersey has some of the highest costing marijuana and some of the weakest marijuana, because the strongest potency you can get in New York is about 10% of that THC, which is one of the psychoactive medications or drugs in the marijuana smoke. Um, so that's limited in New Jersey to 10%. But certainly the different strains have different balances of THC to cannabinoids, and that can have different effects on different people. So uh, it, it doesn't seem like there is going, they, oh, I can tell you in New Jersey, there is a maximum strength, but there doesn't seem to be a minimum, minimum. if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Rick asked the question, <laughs> are we obligated to pay for munchies? <laughs> 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 a lot more questions about drug theory uh, workplaces, um, and a lot of questions here that I think we've gone over a few times about, uh, can we deny opioids once they're on medicinal marijuana? And so far, I think the answer to that is no, not yet. Uh, if you want to make the case law on that, uh, we'll help you with that. But right now, I don't think the case law is saying that. No. In the cases that I've read, the, the claimant has stayed on narcotics, and this was uh, something to augment that. In addition, well. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Carol asks a funny question. What if someone who is a non-smoker develops chronic obstructive pulmonary disease after smoking marijuana for a few years? We have to pay for this diagnosis. Yeah, I think so. I think you end up with a causally related consequential, consequential injury. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Linda asks a question, we'll end with this one. Uh, is there a way to determine if the claimant is taking medicinal marijuana uh, versus marijuana off the street? And I don't think there's any way to know that at this time. No. All right. All right. So I'm seeing that people are starting to drop down. We're getting down into the low hundreds now. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us over email, phone call. We're happy to answer any questions you have, any cases you'd like to discuss. We're here for you. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing a webinar about the virtual hearing process, which is finally coming to Hopbock. Yes. Good yes. news. So uh, next week, join us for that. And then uh, at the end of the week, I think August 13th is when Hopog Garden City go virtual. So uh, please join us for that. Have a great week. Email us any questions. Bye.